That's the theme from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight is a program of adventure with Howard Duff as your host. Here's a preview. I've been doing some detective work on Sutherland and his drug therapy program. Hey. Found out anything? Some. Nothing concrete yet. You sound like you're expecting something. I am. I can't tell you about it just yet. The Sears Radio Theater will begin after this message from your local station. Our story takes place in a small, quiet town along the Pacific Northwest coast. Nothing much happens here. That is, not until one night late in the year. That was the night that Sheriff Jake Barnes would never forget. It all started one November morning. Tim Carver and his son are heading toward the river to do some fishing. Suddenly, a man steps out from the bushes, blocking the road. Tim finds himself looking into the barrel of a rifle. Hey, what's the trouble, mister? Can't you read? The sign says no trespassing. Well, I've never noticed that sign before. I've been using this road for years. But you won't be using it anymore. This ranch belongs to me now, and I don't want anyone on my land. Well, my boy and I just want to do a little fishing. We won't disturb nothing. You'll have to fish someplace else. Now, get out. Okay, okay, we're going. But you'll hear about this. Tim returns to town and angrily tells the sheriff what happened. Must be some misunderstanding, the sheriff thinks, and he decides to pay the man a visit. Little does Jake Barnes know that his visit will provoke a chain of events that will change his life. And that's only the beginning of our story. Sears Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis' production of... The Sears Radio Theater. Our story, The Value of a Hunch, by Anne Heath. Our star, Vic Perrin. The Sears Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops for value. There's an unwritten law in this part of the country that its abundant natural resources are to be shared by everyone. Neighbors being chased away at gunpoint is not a usual occurrence. Who is this newcomer, and what could he be protecting? I've been sheriff of this county for 15 years. I was proud of the low crime rate. As for violence, well, on Saturday night, some local boys might get a little drunk and smash the mailboxes out on Route 1. One night, they let some cattle out, too, but the next day, they helped round them up. There were no hard feelings. The hostile way this new fellow was acting reminded me of big city ways. Such ways had no place in these parts. I figured the stranger had listened to reason once he understood our local custom, but then I hadn't met John Sutherland. Morning. You, uh, Mr. Sutherland? Yes, I am. Well, my name's Jake Barnes. I'm the sheriff hereabouts. What brings you out this way, Sheriff? Anything wrong? No, no, nothing serious. Just a little misunderstanding. Misunderstanding? Well, I'm told Tim Carver and his boy were out your way this morning. There was a man, yes. And you refused to let him go to the river to fish? I did. This is private land, Sheriff. Indeed it is. But you see, folks around here have been using that road for a long time. The river's a mighty good place to fish for salmon. I'm sure there are other places. Yes, but that's not quite the point. You see, Mr. Sutherland, all the ranchers around here allow the local boys to fish the streams that run through their property. No one has ever refused access to the river before. What the other ranchers do is their business. I have the right to refuse access to anyone. Now, don't get heated up. I didn't come here to argue your right to do as you see fit. I just thought if you understood how we do things around here... Look, Sheriff, I have a good reason for not wanting people coming onto the ranch. Oh? I didn't want to tell anyone, at least not right away. I didn't want people to get the wrong impression. But I guess you have a right to know. Know what? You see, Sheriff, I'm using the ranch as a base for my drug rehabilitation program. Drug rehabilitation? I've heard of those places. Uh, and you could see why it's important that the inhabitants not be disturbed. Uh, those men over there, are they some of the, uh, uh inhabitants? Uh, yes, yes, they are. And they're a bit uncomfortable around strangers. I see. Well, I guess you do have a special reason for wanting your privacy, huh? I'll tell everybody to fish further down river. Thank you, Sheriff. Be seeing you. Goodbye. Something about Sutherland didn't set right with me. His eyes were cold and cruel. 
And his hair was too close cropped even for my taste. And those two men lurking in the shadows bothered me. They must have all gone to the same barber. I'd seen newspaper photographs of some people in California who had severe haircuts just like that. They were part of a group that began for the purpose of drug rehabilitation, but uh, soon turned into a violent cult. Police found a huge stockpile of arms at the organization's headquarters. Maybe this was a splinter group. Last thing I wanted in my county. Oh, I'm chilled to the bone. Me too. This nighttime stakeout just ain't my cup of tea. You know, we've been on this hill every night for a week. Nothing's happened. Except for those flashing lights down there. Yeah, and them are kind of weird. What could they be doing in the middle of the night? No, I don't know. Maybe those junkies are afraid of the dark. Hey, starting to rain. I'm not going to just sit here and get soaked again tonight. Let's move in closer. and we can see what they're up to down there. Jake told us to stay out of sight. Nobody will see us in the dark. Come on, follow me. Okay. Just remember whose ID this was. Stop, stop. Hey, Bill, help me, will you? I- I'm stuck in this here dang hole. Oh, can't you watch where you're going, Joe? Uh, there. Uh, now, stick close to me. Thank you. Hey, look at this. At what? Here on the ground. Tire tracks. Hey, them are huge. What can make tracks that size? Nothing I've ever seen. <laughs> we, we must be in the land of the giants. Hey, listen. Sounds like those Dobermans we saw through the binoculars. Let's get out of here. Yeah, I'm right behind you. Oh, my God. That's a bull. He's coming after us. Oh, run for your life. Well, I thought we... I thought we'd never make it back up here. <laughs> we we could have been killed. Uh, let's make our report and go home where it's dry. And warm. My deputies weren't happy with their assignments, but what they told me about the lights, the dogs, and those mysterious tire tracks, that was enough to convince me that Sutherland and his group were up to something. I was afraid that something involved guns. The next day, I decided to do some looking around on my own from the air. Jake Barnes is an easygoing man. But now, believing that his town and the people who live around it are threatened, he becomes a man with a purpose. With single-minded determination, he begins his investigation. How low you want me to fly, Sheriff? As low as you can go without attracting attention. I don't want to arouse any suspicions down there. I don't think they're going to worry any about a crop duster. Don't be too sure. Pretty skittish. What is it you're looking for? I don't know exactly, but I got a hunch we'll find something. Hold on, because here we go. Do you see anything? Not yet. Wait. There's something. Can you get any closer to that clump of trees? Well, uh, I'll try. Just what I thought. What is it? There are a couple of trucks half hidden behind those trees. They look like army surplus trucks. Well, what would those folks be doing with army trucks? That's a question, Charlie, that I don't yet know how to answer. That night, I joined my deputies at the lookout point above the ranch. I wanted to see for myself what was going on. For a while, things were quiet. Then we saw Sutherland's jeep leave and head south toward the coast. Now, where could he be going at that hour? I decided to follow him and find out. I took Joe along. He was still pretty green, and I figured to give him a few pointers. Now, when you're tailing someone, always remember to kill your headlights. Uh-huh. The last thing you want to do is tip off your suspect. Hey, look, 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 Sheriff. That jeep's are turning off. Yeah. He's pulling into the beachfront market. <laughs> Maybe he's forgotten to buy milk. <laughs> now, that's funny. What? He's going into a phone booth. Now, why would he come all this way to make a call? Don't he have a phone at home? He's got one. I checked it out yesterday. It's an unlisted number. He's sure been in there a long time. Hey, hey, here it comes. Get out. He's climbing back in the Jeep. Get out. I will. We don't want him to see us. Looks like he's heading back to the ranch. Let's go check out that phone booth. The, the phone booth? Evidence. Oh, evidence. 
Germany. Well, look you here. What do you make of this? Well, them look like the rolls you put coins in when you go to the bank. It's just what they are. And these are the quarter size, and they're both empty. Who is that guy calling? The Kremlin? <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me. Come on, let's get back to the car. Sutherland's surreptitious long-distance phone calls seemed to fit in with my hunch. And I needed something more conclusive. The next night, Sutherland again left the ranch. I followed alone this time. And this time, he didn't stop at the beachfront market. About five miles further on, he turned off and headed west toward the beach. I drove onto a bluff above a secluded cove and watched as the jeep crawled over the sand and came to a stop. For a while, I sat in the darkness, listening to the sound of the waves rolling on shore. I thought I saw a light blink from somewhere off the coast. Yeah, there it was again. The jeep answered the signal. So that's where those guns were coming from. Now I had to find out where they were being hidden. Later that night, I returned to the ranch. When all the lights had gone out, I made my way on foot down the hill. I came to a large barn. My heart was pounding as I crept along its side. Suddenly, I heard a noise that made my skin crawl. The Dobermans. I'd forgotten all about them. I... I froze, holding my breath. I just hoped they hadn't noticed me. And after what seemed like an hour, I heard the sound of canine snoring. I never knew it could be so appealing. I stole back to my car. I'd have to find a way to deal with those guard dogs. The next morning, I drove out to the Sea Breeze Kennel. The owner, Ned Pierce, used to train police dogs. Dobermans, you say? Yeah, yeah, two of them. Oh, yeah, well, they're tough customers. <laughs> they make nice enough pets, but when they're trained as attack dogs, well, yeah, they're as fierce as starving wolves. Well, is there any way to ward off an attack? Not unless you shoot them. No, 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 no I don't want to do that. Isn't there any way to just uh, keep them quiet for a while? Uh, oh, I see what you mean. Well, yeah, well, there's something you could use, but you've got to know how to handle it. Well, what's that? You heard of a tranquilizer gun? Well, sure, they use them to knock out wild animals. Well, they'll work on dogs, too. Uh, smaller dose, of course. Oh, word of warning. Yeah? Dobermans are lightning fast, and they can be on you before you know it hits you. So you aim careful, and you don't miss, because you ain't going to have a second chance. That night, armed with a tranquilizer gun, I returned to the ranch. There was a cold wind blowing from the north. For once, I was thankful for it. It had helped muffle any sounds I made. I reached the corner of the barn and peeked cautiously into the yard. There they were, lying down, but awake. I ducked back behind the barn and loaded my gun. The first dog would be easy, but could I reload in time to get the second one? I picked up a loose board, leaned it against the barn just in case. My hand shook a little as I took aim. Got it. He can't figure out what hit him. He, he's staggering. He's going down. Oh, the other one spotted me. Here he comes. There's no time to reload the board. <laughs> Sorry, fella. I, I really hated to do that, but it was you or me. On closer inspection, I saw that my eyes had fooled me. They weren't bales, but wooden crates. And they were stacked as high as the ceiling. There was something written on them. I struck another match and moved closer. A, P, P, apples. Clever, very clever. I climbed up on one of the crates and opened it, sure that I'd find weapons inside. It was empty. They were all empty. Suddenly, I heard voices outside. I dropped behind a pile of crates just as two men entered the barn behind a flashlight. Why, some watchdogs. 
One's out like a light, and the other one's probably off chasing rabbits somewhere. Yeah, the boss should have gotten a couple of muck from the pound. The kind has been treated bad. It'd be a lot meaner than those two overfed prima donnas. Hey, wait, shine that light over here, will you? Yeah. I can't find the switch. Oh, okay, I got it. Well, everything seems all right in here. Yeah, we're going to have to move some of these crates. What for? Make room for the next shipment. Oh, yeah. More apples coming. Yeah. <laughs> hey, come on, let's finish the rounds of turning. I'm bush. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? Thought I heard something move. I don't hear nothing. Came from over there behind those crates. Here, give me the flashlight. Yeah. See anything? I'm not sure. Oh! <laughs> What's the matter? He never seen a bat before. <laughs> well, he surprised me, that's all. Oh, uh, sure, sure. <laughs> all right, come on, let's go. I'd had a narrow escape. I waited until the men's footsteps disappeared, then hightailed it back to my car. I'd been disappointed at not finding the guns, but I might have stumbled on something even better. Another shipment, they said. The thought of nabbing those do-gooders red-handed warmed me all the way back to town. What Jake overheard in that barn gives him something to go on. It's a lead, but to where? Without some hard evidence, his hunch will remain just that. Nothing but a hunch. I've never been good at waiting, especially for something like a shipment of guns. To help pass the time, I went fishing with my friend Tim Carver... He found a spot about a mile downstream from Sutherland's place where the salmon were plentiful. Under a threatening sky, we put on our waders and went out into the river. Last week, my boy and I caught a big one right here in this spot. I don't know what I'd do if I couldn't fish for salmon, especially since Mary left. Kind of helps ease the loneliness. Yeah. And it's something I can share with my son. Oh, it's a relaxation, all right. Just wish I didn't have things on my mind so that I could enjoy it more. What's eating you? Yeah, I've been doing some detective work on Sutherland and his drug therapy program. Have you found out anything? Some. Nothing concrete yet. You sound like you're expecting something. I am, Jim, but I can't tell you about it just yet. Well, what makes you so sure those folks aren't what they claim to be? There have been a few too many unexplained things going on at that ranch. i got a strong hunch they're connected with that cult that was causing all the trouble down in California. They might even be in cahoots with some terrorist. Oh, now, hold on, Jake. We never had anything like that around here. And that is what worries me. I admit Sutherland is not the friendliest guy I ever met, but that don't mean he's a radical. Well, we'll see about that, Tim. We'll see. Hey, look. What's that red thing floating downstream? Looks like... like an apple. Here comes some more. Now, where do you suppose they're coming from? Look up there. upstream from us, partially hidden behind some saplings, was a man. He had one of those short haircuts. Why is he staring at us? You there! What are you doing? Why won't he answer? Now, I don't like his looks, Jake. Me neither. I think I'll go have a talk with him. I started waiting upstream. Before I could get too close, the inhabitant, that's what he was, all right, slowly raised a rifle and pointed it at me. We faced each other for a moment. Then the man suddenly turned and disappeared through the underbrush. By the time I climbed up onto the bank, he was gone. He'd left his jacket behind. I bent down and picked it up. It was an army field jacket, the camouflage variety. A little further on, I found some tire tracks in the grass. Nearby, there were a bunch of apple crates scattered on the ground. Most of them were still full of fruit. Yeah. Under ordinary circumstances, I'd have brought that man in, but this time I let him go. I was pretty sure he hadn't recognized me, and I didn't want to jeopardize that shipment. I kept the jacket as evidence. When I returned to town, I was surprised to see Sutherland's Jeep in front of my office. He was waiting for me inside. Right away, I could tell this wasn't going to be a friendly visit. And then I saw the barn board, the one I'd used on that dog. My dogs was killed last night. I want you to find out who did it. Killed? I paid $1,000 for those dogs. Their training alone costs half that much. Now, I want to know who's responsible. Are you sure it wasn't one of your own people? I don't know one of them who'd do a thing like that. Well, I don't know anyone either. 
Why would somebody want to kill a dog? Maybe he had a reason. What would that be? Whoever killed that dog did it because he didn't want to be discovered. He couldn't have been a burglar. Why not? Well, how much could he carry on foot? No, I think the man who killed my dog was there to spy on us. Spy on you? Why? Because some people think we're freaks, weirdos. Sutherland, I think you're on the wrong track. I can't believe anyone would We want to... have nothing to hide, but I won't be spied upon. I'm going to instruct my men to shoot any intruder on sight. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You can't do that. I can and I will, Sheriff. Unless you find whoever killed my dog. And when you do, I want to see him. He won't be easy to track down. Then you better get started. Good day, Sheriff. If Sutherland was guilty of any crime, he sure didn't act like it. He was a tough one. But despite his convincing bluff, I was more sure than ever that he did have something to hide. A week passed, and nothing happened. I began to fear Sutherland had been spooked into calling off the shipment. The evidence so far added up to nothing without the guns themselves. I had to find a way to clear the way for that shipment. But how? Then I got an idea. On the premise that I was still tracking the culprit who killed that Doberman, I drove out to the ranch to investigate. You haven't found that killer yet? No. No, not yet. I want that man found, Sheriff. I'll find him. Thought I'd look around a bit if you don't mind. Maybe find some clues. I'll go with you. Where did you say that dog was killed? It was over by the barn. That big one over there? Yeah. Follow me. Dog's body was found right here. I don't see any signs of a struggle. Why should there be? That dog didn't have a chance. Hmm. Looks like there's still some blood on the ground. Huh. Here's something. What is it? Well, it looks like your dog got a piece of that guy before he died. Here's a scrap of cloth that seems to be torn. Let me see that. It's a funny kind of material, isn't it? Looks like camouflage. It is camouflage. Does that mean anything to you? I'm afraid it does. Uh, didn't I see one of your people wearing a jacket like that? Yeah. Luke. He hasn't been wearing it lately. Well, I think we may have found your man. You want me to take him in? No. I'll deal with him myself. My determination to uncover this cult or whatever it was had caused me to do something I'd never done before. I had implicated an innocent man and for an act I myself had committed. I consoled myself with the thought that Luke, along with his friends, would soon be accused of a far bigger crime because now that shipment would surely go through. On Thanksgiving Eve, Sutherland's ranch was still under 24-hour surveillance. Tim's boy was spending the holiday with his mother, so he invited me and my deputies to share a turkey with him. We ate on rotating shifts, two of us sitting down at the table while the other kept watch from the bluff overlooking the ocean. It was Joe's turn as lookout. More turkey, Jake? Oh, no thanks, Tim. I, I'm kind of off my feed lately. How about you, Bill? Mm, I'll have some more. Your cooking's not half bad. Well, thanks for the compliment. <laughs> uh, Jake, there's something i got to say to you. Huh? What is it? You've been my friend for years. I've always respected you for having more good sense than most men. But I think you're carrying this surveillance business too far. I don't think so, Tim. i got to play out my hunch. But it's been weeks now. If those guys are up to something, it has shown up by now. I hate to say this, Jake, but... Uh... Joe and I are getting a mite tired of hiding in the bushes for hours, shivering our tails off and getting soaked to the bone. All because of one of your hunches. Can't you see that we're getting close? Now, that shipment will be arriving any day now. And when it does, our trap is ready to spring. What trap? You know as well as I do, we're undermanned, not to mention underpaid. And what if you say is true? Pretty soon we're going to be outgunned to boot. Well, I've taken care of that. What do you mean? I've alerted the Coast Guard. And the SWAT team is on non-drinking status. They're ready for action when I give the signal. The SWAT team? Yep. Jake, you've been watching too many cop shows on TV. From now on, this operation will be referred to as Code Apple. Uh, it's time I relieve Joe. He'll be getting hungry by now. I've seen it! I've seen it! I've Take seen it. it easy, Joe. Ah, I've seen the signal light. Where? Yeah, off the coast, about two miles out. Ah, at last. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Thank you. 
Sears National Automotive Sale. Save $48 to $92 on a set of four Sears Road Handler Radial Tires. That's the largest savings of the year on Sears' best steel-belted radios. And get the full power of the maintenance-free Sears 48 battery for a full $7 off. Now, just $42.99 with trade-in. This is the minimum national savings. Regular price varies in some markets. Sale ends July 28th. Super values at most Sears Tire and Auto Centers. Stop. 25% off on kids' winter jackets and coats. Another super value from Sears. Ah, summer. Grass growing. Fish jumping. Kids out fooling around. And uh-oh, winter's coming. Sears will help you keep them warm at 25% off. Kids' winter jackets and coats on sale till July 28th. Styles for boys, girls. Sizes from babies to teens. Now 25% off. Available in most larger Sears retail stores. Dates may vary in Alaska and Hawaii. Sears, where America shops for value. Strawberries, somewhere with hand-painted strawberries, 45 piece set plus extra serving bowl, Sears Strawberries. Sears hand-painted strawberry stoneware has delectably sweet country looks, and durable, this dishwasher-safe stoneware resists chipping, cracking, or fading, even when exposed to your oven, freezer, or a microwave oven. Enhance your table with these pretty strawberries from Sears. Strawberries, Sears stoneware with hand-painted strawberries. At most larger Sears retail stores. <laughs> Duff again. And here's the concluding act of the value of a hunch. Joe had brought the news I'd been waiting for. Adrenaline pumping, I jumped up from the table. I sent Bill to watch the ranch while Joe and I returned to the lookout post on the bluff. Light rain began to fall as we stared out over a bleak sea. And then, peering through the dark, I saw it. The faint silhouette of a large ship offshore. There she is, Joe. Well, how big is she? Here, here, look for yourself. Oh. I, I can't quite focus. Oh, there. There, I see her. Wow, she's big. Looks like a trawler. Those guys must be starting an army. What do you suppose they aim to do? I don't know. All I know is we got to stop them. That must be Bill. This is 22 Baker, 43. This is 21 Charlie, 40. Thought you'd want to know, Sutherland just left the ranch. Which way was he headed? south, and he was hightailing it. Okay. Sit tight till I get the word. Right. There's one more thing. What's that? I'm sorry about what I said. <laughs> you had a right to speak your mind. After all this is over, I'll buy you a beer. Hell, I'll buy you a whole six-pack. It's a deal. Good luck up there. Thanks. 10-4. I radioed the Coast Guard to stand by. Now I was faced with a big decision. To order in the troops or to wait. I knew Sutherland was clever, and I knew he was cautious. I gambled that he'd ordered a heat run to see if they were being watched by police. I just prayed I was right. Joe and I kept watch through the night. Toward midnight, the rain let up and the fog began to close in. We pulled blankets around us and listened to a lone foghorn as it sounded its melancholy warning. The steady rhythm of the waves breaking on shore seemed to repeat, you've made a mistake, mistake. I had nightmare visions of apple crates filled with guns and ammunition slipping through my fingers. The next morning, I woke with a start. I didn't know when I'd fallen asleep. The day was gray and unforgiving. Sheriff? What time is it? Almost 6.30. How long was I out? Oh, I don't know. I, I fell asleep, too. You what? Well, did, did I do something wrong, Sheriff? Give me those binoculars. I know they're here somewhere. Oh, oh, here they are under the blanket. Huh. Yeah. Give me here. Oh. Well, I can't see a thing. They must have pulled out during the night. I just hope we didn't miss the boat last night. No pun intended. Well, I'm a real light sleeper. I would have heard if anything had gone on down there. I doubt it, Joe. Those waves are loud enough to cover any noise. And I'll wager those crooks know how to work fast and quiet. Well, I still think I would have heard them. Well, you got no choice now but to wait. We'll know by tonight. Our vigil continued through the following day. And that night, Bill joined us on the bluff. Things were quiet. Too quiet. Then, along about 10 o'clock, we noticed some activity down on the beach. I started breathing a whole lot easier. Joe spotted the ship again. 
Do you have no lights on? Then we saw something we'd never seen in this part of the country. Hey, what's that? Where? Down there on the beach. See? It's moving toward the water. Huh. Looks like one of those landing crafts the Army used during the war. Huh. I'll be darned. It's an amphibian. So that's the giant that made those tracks we saw that night near the ranch. Uh-huh. Well, this is some operation, boys. Hey, looky. There's Southern and Sheep. Yep. Hand me the phone. This is 22 Baker 43 calling the Coast Guard. Can you read me? Affirmative. 10-5. Code Apple is a go. How soon can you get the boats and choppers here? I need a 1020, Sheriff. Our CP is on a bluff above Seal Cove. The party's about to start on the beach right below us. The boats are heading out now. I can have the choppers there in five minutes. Well, don't move in till you see my signal flare. We'll be watching for it. 10-4. Down below, dark figures began darting around as the amphibian brought in its load. Apple crates, dozens of them. The men started unloading and carrying the crates to the waiting army trucks. Sheriff, are we going to move in? No, 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 not yet. But they're going to get away. No, they won't. Not this time. An unexpected thing happened. As one of the men lifted a crate onto the truck, he lost his grip and it fell, spilling its contents onto the sand. I squinted through the binoculars. What I saw was not what I expected. Sprawled there on the beach were not weapons, but neat cardboard packages wrapped in plastic. And all at once it dawned on me. Sutherland was running a drug program, all right. But the therapy was profit. He was smuggling the stuff. This really is big. Get ready, boys. I'm sending up the flare. Come on. Shouldn't we wait for the others? They'll be right behind us. Let's go. This is the last one. Uh, Careful now. Don't don't drop it. This ought to bring at least 30 big ones. Yeah, maybe more. And the word is we'll be moving operations after this run. Oh, where to? It's a secret. Boss doesn't trust anybody anymore. Police! You're under arrest? Don't know. Anybody? Ah, knock it off. Who's playing games? This is no game. This is a bust. Hey, they really are cops. Let them have it. We're at number, Sheriff. Where are the reinforcements? Here come the choppers. Don't open them up on the choppers. Well, give them some cover fire. There's a SWAT team. SWAT team over here, boys. It wasn't long before the smugglers realized our forces were too much for them. When the smoke cleared, we'd arrested 12 suspects and confiscated over $30 million worth of high-grade marijuana. The kind of stuff headed for ski resorts and football stadiums. I found out later we'd broken up the largest drug smuggling ring in the region's history. But at the time, I couldn't fully savor the capture. During the confusion, Sutherland had escaped. On the way back to town after the bust, I stopped to pick up a hitchhiker. He was typical of the hippie types that seemed to be attracted to our area. Unkempt, wearing dirty, threadbare clothes and hiking shoes. He had on a floppy hat which hid his face as he got into the car. You know, you really shouldn't be hitching rides, especially late at night. It could be dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't exactly the talkative kind. One other thing about him wasn't typical. His hair. I didn't see any below that hat. Where you headed? South. I'm headed south. Even in a whisper, I recognized the voice. I decided to play along for a while. Well, I'll uh, take you as far as I'm going. You care for a cigarette? No, thanks. I'm trying to quit myself. You can have me an apple instead. Want one? There's no reply. I reached under the seat for an apple. As I took my first bite, I turned to see a 38 pointed at my head. So you know, Sheriff. I did have a hunch with you, Sutherland. Take me to San Francisco. Afraid I can't do that. Do as I say or I'll blow your head off. I don't think you will. Unless you want to get shot yourself. Huh? You see, I rigged up a little device for occasions like this. When I reached for that apple, I flipped the switch. Right now, there's a gun somewhere in this car, and it's pointed in your direction. 
And all I have to do is press a button with my foot. How do I know you're not lying? You don't. You want to take that chance? All right, you win. This isn't worth getting killed over. I'll take the gun. That's better. Now we can both enjoy the ride. Tell me, Sheriff. Was there really a gun on me? You're not the only one who can run a good bluff, my friend. Yeah. I should have known. Uh, where are you taking me? To your new living quarters? You like my jail. It's real cozy. And just to make you feel at home, I'll make sure you have plenty of apples. <laughs> yes, sir. An apple a day for a lifetime. Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company, where our policy is satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Sears, where America shops for value. The Value of a Hunch was written by Ann Heath, produced and directed by Fletcher Marco. Your host was Howard Duff. Our star was Vic Perrin. Featured in the cast were Marvin Miller, Jack Crucian, Stephen Marco, Jack Carroll, Dawes Butler, and Howard Culver. The music for Sears Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. This is Art Gilmore speaking. Associate Director of Sears Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is production supervisor, and the recording engineers are Joe Wachter and Hal McDonald. The Elliott Lewis production of Sears Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Next Monday's Sears Radio Theater will be a story of the West with Lorne Green as your host. Let's listen. Terrible. They chase the stage, they surround us, and then they shoot everybody. Apaches? Men dressed like soldiers. He's a lying polecat. Troopers, me I. What's your name? Lopez, mi coronel. So be sure and tune in next Monday to the Sears Radio Theater. Entertainment with great music and more. People like Otis Thomas and Laurie Allen on KMOX FM, St. Louis. KMOX FM. CBS News. The Sandinista-supported junta in Nicaragua may take moves to have former President Somoza extradited. This is John Bohannon reporting on the CBS Radio Network. There's been some talk that the new regime in Nicaragua will ask the United States to help in returning Somoza to face a number of charges, including misappropriation of money. George Natanson has the latest. As the present extradition treaty between Nicaragua and the United States does not take into account political crimes, the sources here say the Nicaraguan request to extradite Somoza would be based on fraud and misappropriation of public funds. According to reliable sources, the junta is building a strong case against the former dictator. In a recent statement, Sergio Ramirez, nominal leader of the five-member junta, said that proof has been found that the Nicaraguan central bank issued checks to Somoza directly or to persons close to him in varying amounts totaling more than $8 million. The checks were drawn from public institution accounts and dated just prior to Somoza being thrown out of office. Ramirez said the checks were intercepted in the United States and have been returned to Nicaragua. George Nathanson for CBS News in Managua. Somoza had been living in exile in Miami, but about a week ago he left aboard a chartered yacht for what was described as a vacation, perhaps in the Caribbean or in Europe or somewhere else. A spokesman for the new Sandinista-backed revolutionary government in Nicaragua says the regime is ready to hold elections. The election, says the spokesman, will be com completely free, something he says Nicaraguans have never seen. Cuba has re-established relations with Nicaragua after a break of 18 years. President Carter has asked Mayor Neil Goldschmidt of Portland, Oregon, to be his new transportation secretary, and he wants former Mayor Moon Landrieu of New Orleans to be Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. Earlier today, the Senate confirmed the nominations of Patricia Harris as Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare and the nomination of W. Graham Clater as De Deputy Defense Secretary. Mr. Carter is now at Camp David. Michael Shetley of Daytona Beach, Florida, has an experimental car, a 1979 model, which he calls a turbo diesel. He's been claiming that his car gets up to 110.6 miles per gallon. But the Environmental Protection Agency tested the car and reported that it got only 34 miles per gallon in city driving and 52 miles per gallon on the highway. That's described as no better than most fuel-efficient cars now available. 
But Michael Shetley says the EPA is wrong. It was a complete conspiracy to downgrade the American people and uh, myself, and they were successful at this point. And I was, I'm glad to see that it happened the way it did because I have got some facts and some documentation that we will use next week to prove that the EPA is nothing but a ripoff. The EPA also says Shetley's car flunked pollution standards. Thousands of people are returning to their homes in parts of Indiana and Texas where flooding caused evacuations earlier in the week. Tropical Storm Claudette caused the floods in Texas where five more people were reported killed today. That raises the death count to seven because of the storm. Governor Bill Clement says the storm has caused more than $700 million in damages along coastal areas of Texas. James McEachern of Tulsa, Oklahoma, has reported a missing house. He bought an old wood frame house two months ago when he heard the city wanted to move it because of a new highway. McEachern decided to have it moved himself, but he says when he checked out the site this week, there was nothing there except 